On this week in space, we're joined by Colonel Eileen Collins of the U.S. Air Force, the first woman to pilot and command a space shuttle, uh, among other countless achievements. So stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 55, recorded on March 31st, 2023. Eileen Collins, the first female space shuttle commander. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Women in Space edition. I'm Tarek Malik, Editor-in-Chief of Space.com, and today I'm joined with a former astronaut and uh, uh, the first woman to command a U.S. spacecraft, Eileen, uh, Colonel Eileen Collins, uh, an author of Through the Glass Ceiling to the Stars, the story of the first American woman to command a space mission. Uh, Eileen, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me here. Great. Well, we, we, we appreciate it. Rod uh, is on uh, on his own ship, uh, commanding his own trip uh, uh, off the uh, the California coast this week. So before we begin, that means that uh, I have the, the, the honor of our, our space joke this week. And uh, this week's joke comes from loyal listener uh, Matthew McCormick, who asks, um, <clears throat> I want to make sure I get this right. So uh, he asks, uh, What's an astronaut cowboy's favorite place in the solar system? Anybody? Anybody? No? Home, home on Lagrange. Right? All right. See, he got he got he got the uh, uh, the symbols there. Thank you so much, Matthew. I I was worried about crickets, but uh, but no, I got it. And for folks who may not be in the know, those Lagrange points are very stable places in uh, in our like around our our planet of gravity. So you can like park your spacecraft there. Uh, probably not have a campfire, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. So. Um, well, great. Well, uh, and as always, by the way, we invite everyone to join Team Me this year, uh, or this week, uh, and, and send us your best or worst space joke. And and don't forget, uh, you can always uh, uh, do us a favor and make sure to like and subscribe uh, for our, our podcast here. Uh, it is free and we really do appreciate it. So let's get it, go ahead and get into some headlines. I've got a few uh, big stories this week. One of them much bigger than the others. Uh, we have found what looks like the largest black hole of all time, so big, in fact, that scientists have called it an ultra massive black hole. It can it packs a wall, but it's got the mass of 30 billion suns. And if you're wondering how big that is, there's like 100 billion stars in our galaxy for the Milky Way. So that's a third of a galaxy crammed into one uh, giant uh, black hole. It's a uh, it's a black hole at the center of this galaxy cluster called Abel. 1201 and scientists found it uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope, but not just by looking at it, they used a, a gravitational lens and that's where the light from this black hole uh, passes through, uh, pa- passes by like another source, a galaxy, you know, between us and that uh, that cluster, and it warps it, and they're able to see a lot farther and a lot a lot clearer than they would uh, otherwise. Uh, it is crazy, <laughs> a crazy discovery that they've been able to find, uh, but they're hoping that they're going to be able to understand how these massive uh, monster black holes uh, form over time, and uh, uh, you know, it it is at the upper limit of what they think these black holes can actually reach. You know, the, the scientists said, basically, you know, it seems to be, you know, the, 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 the big, uh, the, 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 the big, uh, uh, Papa, if you will, of black holes. And, uh, they're going to have to wait and see if, if, you know, they can get, uh, anything else in the, uh, on the, the interim scale to see if there's, if there's a, uh, a growth chart, if you will, between supermassive black holes, like the one at the center of our own uh, galaxy, uh, or Sagittarius A star, or M87, the one that we've seen uh, with the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, you know, what that evolution is like to get to these uh, black holes. They're so big and so distant that they're almost impossible to study, uh, aside from uh, their, the X-ray radiation that they send out. So they want to see how they can uh, see more of these in the future. So gravitational lensing makes that possible because they can't uh, use the, any other means to do it. So 
Very, very cool find from the, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope team. Uh, and uh, uh, up next on my, my docket, and some readers uh, and listeners may not be surprised uh, to, to, to hear this, but Boeing's uh, first Starliner astronaut mission has been delayed again. Uh, and this was uh, uh, from space.com, but also from a few other sources. Ars Technica actually uh, had, uh, Eric Berger at Ars Technica had a, a, an early sign that this was going to happen uh, last week. We did get a, a notice that NASA was going to have a teleconference this week about the Boeing mission. They did, in fact, have that, and they have pushed the first crewed launch of the Boeing Starliner vehicle uh, back to no earlier, they think, uh, than July 21st. And this is disappointing uh, because, you know, they've been trying to get this mission up and off the ground for a number of months now. It was delayed from a late April uh, launch uh, around the 29th or 30th they were targeting uh, to May uh, because they were trying to to do some final checks and they've got some limitations on when they want to fuel uh, the Starliner capsule. Uh, they've got a 60-day time limit for when they fuel it to when they want to launch it because it can have um, it can lead to corrosion of some valves, which is what scrubbed the launch of the uncrewed test flight uh, a couple of times last year. So they want to avoid that. In the meantime, the traffic to the space station has gotten a lot heavier. Uh, Axiom Space and SpaceX want to launch their uh, second crewed flight, a private crewed flight to the space station. Uh, also, uh, the the uh, the United Launch Alliance, which launches the Atlas V rockets that use uh, that that Starliner will use to go to uh, space, they have their own missions in the pipeline as well, and and also. NASA and Boeing kind of want to do some more testing on some Starliner systems, including its vital parachute systems uh, that they want to make sure that they're, they're going to perform as expected. That's a really vital system uh, that will help the spacecraft come back and make a land landing uh, with its astronaut crew at the end of its mission. So they want to make sure they've got some extra time to check all of those boxes when they're looking at the launch schedule uh, in May and June. Uh, looking a bit packed for them to make it. So they've pushed it out to July uh, and now it's going to be... Um, uh, about a year after that, uh, that that last test flight that they had done uh, for the uncrewed flight uh, when uh, for NASA as well. So, uh, so a bit of a disappointment there. Uh, it does, I think, ease their schedule a bit, but there's a, a crew of astronauts that's been waiting a long time for that vehicle to be ready, and uh, we do hope that they, um, they get a chance to, uh, to launch soon. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, this was a, 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 the end of a chapter that we've been following for the last few months. Russia's uh, Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft, that leaky uh, Soyuz that vented all of its coolant into space back in December, is now back on Earth. Uh, the, uh, the spacecraft itself uh, returned to the, to the Earth on Tuesday, empty, uh, with the exception of a few payloads of science experiments. Uh, and it, uh, it landed uh, on the steps of Kazakhstan in the morning uh, after a very swift departure. Uh, I think it landed about three hours, two hours earlier uh, than uh, a normal crude Soyuz would be. But this does end the whole saga of Russia's uh, leaky Soyuz spacecraft. They think it was damaged by a micrometeorite that hit... Uh, a coolant line uh, on the service module and then vented all the coolant into space. That means that the temperatures uh, were going to be too high to be comfortable for a, an actual crew, uh, Frank Rubio and two Russian cosmonauts uh, that were going to be on that vehicle originally. Uh, those three men are stuck on the space station until uh, September when they're due to come back again. They did get a replacement Soyuz. It just arrived uh, in uh, this month, actually. And uh, so they, they're fine. They've got a, a lifeboat now if they need it. But for several weeks, they... They really didn't have a way off the space station if there was an emergency and Russia had to come up with plans to maybe try and fly two cosmonauts on this vehicle uh, and make sure that they would be okay uh, in the, the, the faster method to come home. Meanwhile, SpaceX and NASA developed a way to build an extra seat, move uh, Frank Rubio's seat liner from the Soyuz and cram it inside the, uh, the Dragon spacecraft uh, that was only built for four at this point for that mission uh, in case they needed it. So, you know, luckily they didn't have to worry uh, about uh, or didn't have to use any of those systems. Uh, and this vehicle will be studied to see how the internal crew, carb uh, crew compartment uh, withstood those temperatures on the way back down. But unfortunately, because <laughs> the Soyuz uh, separates into three different compartments during reentry and it jettisons that service module on the way back down, that service module is the, the aft skirt where that has the engines and stuff on it, has all of the, the solar panels. They don't get that back. And that means that the engineers and investigators that may have wanted to see exactly what that um, 
what that uh, a micrometeorite strike might look like and and how to guard against it in the future. They don't. They, they have to deal with uh, only the photos that they took in space of it. So, uh, so it is a, a bit unfortunate. They did see a similar leak on a, a Russian Progress spacecraft, and the the big question now is: is that a design issue with those service modules, or is it not? And that that investigation is ongoing. But uh, and there's a picture of the actual. Uh, damage to the service module uh, that that you can see right there. So this was taken by by cosmonauts on the space station uh, when the uh, the Soyuz was there, and uh, you know hopefully they'll have enough data from this one strike and the one on the Progress vehicle uh, that they were studying to understand like what's going on with that. So uh, a lot of a lot of human spaceflight news this week, uh, which is good because we have uh, one of the the <laughs> the pioneers and the the heroes of human spaceflight with us today. Uh, uh, Colonel uh, Colonel Collins, um, well, thank thank you so much for for being with us uh, today. Well, thanks for having me here with you. I'm very interested in all of the latest news <laughs> that you covered there on uh, in space, and uh, that was excellent. We're living in a renaissance in space exploration right now, and thanks for keeping people up to speed on what's happening up there. Well, well, thank thank you, thank you too. And you know, you, you mentioned a, re, a, a renaissance, but you know, in in your in your book, and I should point out that uh, uh, your the, the the latest copy of uh, of your book with Jonathan Ward through the glass ceiling uh, to the stars, uh, you know, is is out now. It's a it's a a paper but, uh, back version, right? So it's the latest uh, updated version. But can you give us an idea of why um, uh, uh, you a, a four time a space shuttle flyer, the first female pilot, the first uh, a woman to command a, a space shuttle. Uh, why now to, to put together a, a book like this and, and kind of uh, share your career, your path to space with, um, uh, with the public? Well, the answer on why now is pretty simple and straightforward. The pandemic hit in March of 2020. All of my travel canceled. So I had some extra time on my hands and Jonathan Ward had been asking me about writing a book together. I told him no uh, <laughs> prior to that. And then I called him up and said, hey, you know, I think I think I'm ready to do it. For many, many years, I've been asked, where is your book? Where is your book? And I didn't want to write a book. I just wanted to live my life. And writing a book is a huge undertaking. And if I did it, I wanted to make sure that it was really good. You know, I didn't want to just write something quickly and get it out there because, you know, I, I just finished flying my last space mission and I had about <laughs> 12 authors saying, let's write a book. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to do it. So in March of 2020, I realized I had the time. Um, I wasn't going to be traveling anywhere for quite a while. And it took about a year to, to write the book, but why overall, I think there were two major reasons. Um, first of all, to document the history of my four space shuttle missions, which were absolutely amazing, exciting, wonderful adventures. I would love to go flying, fly them <laughs> over again, but uh, you can't do that in life. You know, you get one shot at uh, these things and uh, made some mistakes on those missions. And I wanted to document the history, but also talk about what we did right, what we did wrong, where I made mistakes, you know, how, and I try to do it with a sense of humility. And, you know, a lot of former test pilots are like, you know, big egos and everything's perfect. And I read Chuck Yeager's book <laughs> and I really admire Chuck Yeager, but I wanted to write a different kind of book where people could learn from, uh, you know, mistakes I made and choices I made. And, you know, if, would I do something different if I could go over again? So that's the first. The second reason and the last one I'll mention is to inspire young people to choose, I, I want to say, challenging careers in their life. When you in, are in high school, I'm not sure if you're really exposed to the opportunities in the space program, uh, whether it's you know astronomy oriented, robotics oriented, or human spaceflight. I'm not sure they really get exposed to that, and I'm not sure they get exposed to what it's like in the military. And mm -hmm. you know, I spent the first half of my um, I want to say flying career flying for the Air Force, so I wrote about that and how the Air Force was a wonderful career choice for me. And for women in the military, I think sometimes you hear about the bad things, but there's so, so many more good things and the opportunities for a challenging career, you know, leadership opportunities, you know, teamwork, seeing the world and just educational opportunities. I could just go on and on. And my confidence really increased in my time in the military. I was a very shy uh, kid 
when I was in school, I was afraid to speak up. <laughs> and when I joined the Air Force, it's like, you got to speak up. You know, yeah. if you don't, they're going to call on you and they're going to want to know what you're thinking. And uh, so I'm, I, in the book, I promote, if you're interested in the military, it's something you should consider. If you're interested in doing something challenging and creative, look at the space program, all aspects, whether it's scientific or engineering or, you know, uh, flying airplanes, you know, being an astronaut. So I encourage young people to do that. And I'm hoping that high school and college age students will also read the book. Yeah. Now you were from uh, Elmira, New York, that's upstate New York, right? And, uh, and in, in your book, you mentioned that you'd been interested and, and wanted to be an astronaut since you were a kid. I think you mentioned the, the Gemini program specifically uh, at that time. Uh, but what's that path like? Because you, you do write about uh, a very challenging time in your life growing up as a, as a, a kid and a, a teenager in Elmira. I mean, there were you know, issues with your father. Your, your family was flooded out with Hurricane Agnes in, in 72. What's that path like to become interested in flying uh, as well as, as in a space program, which at the time... Uh, it wasn't even possible uh, for for women to fly in space there. Yeah, yeah, and and there's a lot there uh, to mention. I'll try to just hit the highlights. So my family was um, lower middle class, I'll say, and you know my parents split up when I was nine years old. My mother had to go to work, and I remember my mother saying this over and over again: "I'm the only mother in your entire class that has to work." <laughs> Back in those <laughs> days, mothers pretty much stayed home. But I saw my mother really as a role model and she was decisive. She, you know, she worked hard. She raised us four kids. Um, my dad was around on weekends and there's a whole nother story there. But we had um, the period of time we were on welfare and food stamps, uh, Medicaid, which is, uh, you know, I want to say health care for poor people. And I didn't have any money for flying lessons. And when I told my parents I wanted to fly, I was, I was older. I was a teenager. Like <laughs> we don't have money for that. You want to go to college? We don't have money for that. So I had to go out and figure out how to do that myself. But I think it's in many ways that was, that was good because I had to learn how to take initiative. The reason I was so passionate about doing this is I remember reading about those Gemini astronauts when I was in fourth grade mm -hmm. and I thought they were the coolest guys ever that ever existed. <laughs> and I wanted to be just like them. I, I'm going to be a pilot, a test pilot, an engineer. I'm going to join the military. I'm going to fly jets. And this is what I'm thinking as a little kid. And I could see there were no women, but I, I just thought, well, I'm just going to be a lady pilot. I'm going to be a lady astronaut. And later on in high school, I realized that there were barriers. I mean, I mean, real legal barriers to women flying. And fortunately that changed in 1978. Uh, when I was started pilot training, I was in a, a test program. It actually changed in 1976 when the Air Force decided to start sending women through pilot training. And then I went in in 1978. So I was right at the leading edge of women being able to fly. And the fact that we had a test program going on was a little bit of extra pressure, but I just wanted to fly. And I was so happy to have the opportunity to get in the cockpit of a military airplane and go out and do acrobatics and loops and rolls and <laughs> back and shoot patterns, touch and go landings. And, and I uh, came back as an instructor and, and my goal was get as many flying hours as possible so I can be a test pilot and an astronaut someday. So it, it, I think the timeline worked out good for me. So long answer to your question there, but uh, good question. But, but that, that path then it's, it's, it sounds, if I'm, if I'm getting it right, it's, it's you, you wanted to fly. The, the the Air Force, you know, there was a, a direct pipeline with ROTC and whatnot to get there. Um, and and then the rest is, I guess, in the skies. Is that kind of like a... a yeah, that, a, that's right. Now, you mentioned Elmira, New York, my hometown. It turns out, you know, this probably had a factor in my decision. Elmira is the location of the National Soaring Museum, uh -huh. gliders. And Harris Hill has a glider port and it, the gliders are towed off the hill. <laughs> over Shemung Valley. And as I was a kid growing up, I could, I watched the gliders fly overhead and my dad would take us to the glider field. We'd watch gliders take off. And so I think that really kind of set a little, you know, a little thing maybe in the back of my mind that flying is possible. Um, I never did get a license when I was living there in Elmira in gliders, but I went and got a, a license in, in powered flight. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. 
So, so when, so when you, so you're, you're, you're in the air force, you're, you're, you know, training to, to, to fly, um, uh, to fly planes and jets and, and then going to test pilot school. What is that experience like? I mean, this is a, a different time. I mean, now, you know, having, a, a you know, women serving in the military, women astronauts, um, uh, is, is routine. Like we, we don't think twice too much about it. And there's not as m- many, uh, as I think folks would like, but there's, there's this, uh, this more openness. Whereas when you were in the air force, you know, there, there still, um, uh, were a lot more hurdles. So what is that like to be in the, like, what is a traditionally male, you know, populated, uh, uh a section, you know, in, in pilot training school in, in, uh, Oklahoma, you know, for, for, uh, uh, you know, flying jets and whatnot. I mean, what, how do you, I guess, make, make your, your path and, and, and kind of cut through all that, uh, uh, to show that you your, you know, your talent and your capability there. Well, well, I actually love working with guys <laughs> and, you know, through ROTC and, you know, there, there were, you know, a handful of women in ROTC. And then when I went to pilot training, I was in the first class of women at Vance Air Force Base at my base. And there were four of us. So we got to be pretty good friends. We got to be a, a pretty tight group, uh, but we were split up two in one flight, two in another flight. And but you think about this, there were four women first ever at this base. And there's about 500 pilots total at the base between the instructors and the students. So we really stood out and no one had seen a woman walking around in a flight suit ever. So we would get, you know, people would kind of turn their heads, you know, they would ask us things like, why are you doing that? Or, you know, just kind of, you know, strange uh, comments from people at the, I want to say at the, we call it the BX, which is kind of like the Walmart on, on military bases or, you know, walking through the commissary, you get comments from people. And uh, I, I was, I, I actually uh, was proud of the fact that women were now able to fly and it made me want to work even harder because I mm-hmm. knew as part of a test program, we had to do well, not just to get our wings, but to allow women in the future have the opportunity to go to pilot training. So a little bit of extra pressure there, but you know, I kind of enjoy the extra pressure. I think I do better when there's uh, more expected and more people watching, but I got along great with the guys. I enjoyed working with them. I, and, and, and as I said, at first people would like, I wonder what she's like. And like the bosses would call me in the office and they just didn't know what the women were like. Mm-hmm. I had the wing commander call me in the squadron commander would call me in. I talked about that in the book. Some of the guys thought, oh, yeah, the gals are getting special attention. And I would tell the guy, no, you don't want this kind of special attention. <laughs> you, you just want to go through pilot training. And But so I went through that pretty much in every assignment that I was in, in the Air Force, because there were so few women. Nowadays, there's many more women. And I don't think that the women need to worry about that if you decide to join the military. It's like, why are you here? What's your contribution to the mission? Um, you're part of a team mm-hmm. and you don't, you're not like on a pedestal like we were back. I mean, we're talking 1978. That was a long time ago. And, and, in the women did well. And I must admit that we stand on the shoulders of the women that went before us, the women air force service pilots that did well in, back in world war II, And then the mercury 13 women that did well in the physical and mental testing for the mercury program. So I think, uh, you know, the, organization knew that women would do well. It was more of a cultural problem. Like, how are you going to, how are the women going to fit in the culture? I actually had my wing commander at one of my bases called me in and he said, you know, I'm not sure what to do with you women. He will, by the time you get to the level of Colonel and you're a wing commander, he says, you don't have a wife and my wife works very hard and she does do, 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 do. And he go over a long list and I just don't know how women are going to be wing commanders. I mean, I would get comments like that from the bosses and I just, I didn't know what to say. I was like, listen to them, think about it. Um, but women now we looking back with many, many women have been wing commanders, squadron mm-hmm. commanders, and they seem to be doing a great job. Yeah. Yeah. And did that attitude, did it follow you? Did you experience the same at test pilot school or was it different now? Because now you're in, as you're, I guess in like a, a rarefied uh, uh, setting of like being being a test pilot as opposed to being a, 
uh, uh, like a, I don't know, are there standard pilots? I'm not sure how that yeah. works at the well, airport. So, so I would say, you know, the military has a long history of, you know, a culture of like families and being together and supporting each other. So I'll tell you a little story. And, and by the way, the women have, the presence of women has, has not hurt that at all. I mean, you can ask people their opinions, but I think it's actually strengthened it. Mm -hmm. So here's an example. When I went to test pilot school, I wrote about this in the book because I was the senior ranking officer in the class of 25. I just happened to be a major. So I'm senior ranking officer. I was made the class leader. And the commandant of the school stopped me in the hallway and said to me, is your husband going to run the wives club for your <laughs> class of 25? And I was like, I thought he was joking. So I kind of laughed and he looked at me very sternly and I realized he was not joking. So I went home and I asked my husband, I, I said, the colonel, the commandant wants to know if you're going to run the wives club. Okay, This is tradition, right? This is a big tradition to have. So my husband looked at me and he thought about it for a minute and he said, yeah, I'll run the wives club. Um, <laughs> I will have golf tournaments every Wednesday and we will have. Uh, lingerie shows every Saturday night. <laughs> so, and it became kind of a little bit of a joke. And, and, but I think, you know, I, there were only two women in my class of 25. Um, we did fine. And I think we, we still talk about women in primarily male jobs, but if the women just stay focused on why you're there, what you're doing, do your job, do it as best as you possibly can. Don't be distracted. Just Think about, you know, what's the mission? You know, what are we doing? And if you really love your job, it's going to go just fine. I heard a, a, a bit of advice that you had mentioned about, uh, about being, you know, like, like a first, a first female test pilot, uh, you know, in, in, the school, in, the, in the class there, um, the first female pilot uh, for a space shuttle. You said, um, uh, be the best pilot you can be, not be the best woman pilot, be the best you know, you know, this or that. And, I, and it really kind of grabbed me because it's, it's something that my mother would always tell me is that you don't compare yourself with other people except yourself. Right. And, and that's, that's, that's all, that's all you want to try to do. And, and I'm, I'm curious how that kind of a mantra has applied or how you've applied that, uh, not just through your training, you know, with the Air Force, but through, um, through life in general. I mean, how, how important is it to kind of have that kind of self comparison rather than, uh, than, than kind of exterior pressures um, throughout. The yeah, that, that, that's a great question, a great thought. And I wanted to know as much as possible about the space shuttle. Um, this is true back when I was a test pilot also, whatever plane you're flying. But when I was asked to be a pilot of the space shuttle, my first thought was, I want to learn this ship inside and out. I want to know everything about how the engines operate, the hydraulics, the electronics, the environmental, the computers, the APUs, auxiliary power units. If we ever have an emergency, I want to be on top of it. I want to be the hero that brings the space shuttle back home safely. And I just studied all the time. And I think there's a sense of pride that you can have when you're in the simulator and these malfunctions start coming at you from every direction, that you're able to prioritize them, um, understand what the checklist is telling you to do and be able to do that. And I mean, this was probably the most challenging thing I ever did in my career was these asset and entry sims, you know, launch and re-entry that you do with mission control. So mission control is on the loops and the instructors back there are throwing one malfunction after the other because each flight controller has to have a malfunction in each practice launch. So that could be meaning the pilots got 12 malfunctions that you're trying to work and you have to decide which one do I do first? How much of it should I do? And then when do I start working on the next one? Mm -hmm. And it, it's really just a fun, a, a, the more you know, the faster you're going to get through that. And I made mistakes at the beginning when I first started and I was embarrassed and I was embarrassed. Like, oh, they're going to say that there's the woman making the mistakes. So I was even more motivated to study. And I actually memorized four checklist procedures like helium leak, um, tying the, uh, DC buses together. I don't remember. APU shut down. There were a couple <laughs> others. I memorized them. So when I had to do it in the simulator, I still had the procedure in front of me. I was able to go through it a lot faster. And I also wanted to be the one to kind of help solve the problem. 
So if you, and when I worked as a Capcom in mission control, there was a, a real flight where we weren't able to get the payload bay doors closed and everybody's sitting around there scratching their head. And I still remember I should have studied the payload bay doors more than I did, mm -hmm. but that was kind of the mission specialists uh, were focused on that. And so I jumped in and I started studying more. So I think it's really a sense, uh, I want to say is a, a sense of really wanting to be the best you can be. And if you're going to be flying out there in a spaceship off of planet Earth, you better know, you know, like Scotty and Star Trek, <laughs> you better know everything about your ship because it could save your life someday. Yeah. Well, tell, tell me about that path because you, you became, you joined NASA's 1990 class um, of, of astronauts, um, the hairballs, right? Uh, <laughs> if, if, if memory serves. Um, and and uh, was there, I guess, before you, you applied, was there a favorite plane? that that you know to, to fly at the, at the air force before you had to uh make that make that shift and then how do you uh, like when did you get that word that that was an option to apply now um uh to nasa and did you was it just one try that you got in on that first try or was it uh uh did it take a few times yeah well i'll try to hit those questions pretty sure. quick um, my favorite aircraft by far was the t-38 because i had mm -hmm. flown it so much and you know i felt like what we used to say i'm not strapping into the airplane but I'm strapping the airplane onto me. And it, the, the airplane is just an extension of you as you go off and fly. Um, but I did fly the TR-1, which is a, a two-seat version of the U-2 high altitude reconnaissance plane. And I, I really enjoyed that. And also the A-7, the reason I enjoyed the A for attack, and this was uh, a Navy and an Air Force plane. The reason I really enjoyed the A-7 is the air the airplanes that we had at the test pilot school were only single seat. So the first time you flew it, you went up by yourself. Um, you had to take a bold phase test and a test on the, what we call the engine limits and the aircraft limitations. And if you pass the test, they'd give you the keys to the airplane. <laughs> and, and I got to fly that plane three times solo. And it, it's, it is a very, very stable aircraft. And there's many more, you know, I got, chance to fly the F-15, F-16, and some of those that were leading edge airplanes at the time. Your second question was about uh, applying as an astronaut. Um, I did get in on my first application. Oh, wow. Part of that was because I tried to apply for the class of 84. I was too young and my application didn't go through. I have to go through the military. So mm -hmm. uh, being active duty military, whether you're Army, Navy, Air Force, whatever service you're in, you're service has a pre-selection board. So I had to go through that. And then I tried to apply for the class of 87. That didn't work again because of I was changing jobs in the Air Force at the time. So the first time that I actually had an application go to the Air Force, um, the Air Force uh, selected me and then I went uh, to NASA and I was already a major. So I wasn't very young. I was probably in about the middle age of astronaut selection. I was 33 years old when they uh, selected me. I applied as a mission specialist. You remember back in the shuttle days, there were two categories of astronauts, pilot, mission specialist. I interviewed as a mission specialist because I hadn't graduated yet from the Air Force Test Pilot School. But NASA selected me as a pilot because the graduation happened before we started training at Johnson Space Center. Uh, so that so that's uh, how it worked. And some people have to apply six or seven times, and you know that's that's not bad on you. That's just what our NASA's needs at the time. So if someone applies and they don't get in, don't be discouraged. Just keep applying. And I tell people, to, I mean, some of the, you know, I want to say, well, all of our astronauts are fantastic, but some of them you'll see admit, yeah, I got on on my seventh seventh try, <laughs> and and good for them for not giving up. That's yeah. what I have to say. Well, that, that reminds me of Clay Anderson, who said that he applied 13 different times <laughs> to, oh, to get in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I believe it. And he he was a huge asset to the astronaut program. It was great to have him. So what, what, was it a surprise? I mean, you, you apply as a mission specialist. You expect that if, if you get in, you're going to be mission specialist duty things. And then you you get word that, no, you'll be a pilot and you'll pilot the, 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 the space shuttle. You'll command, you know, a space shuttle. What? Was that a surprise to you at all? Or did they just kind of let you know that that was that was that? Well, you know, it was kind of a surprise. I actually applied when I did the paper paperwork. I applied for pilot and mission specialist, mm -hmm. but the Air Force sent me forward only as a mission specialist. 
So when I came before the astronaut board, I only came in the astronaut in the uh, mission specialist category. So in my actual interview, I was asked at least four times, maybe five times, would you rather be a pilot? <laughs> Every time I told them, well, I applied as a pilot, I'm probably more qualified as a pilot because that's my career. That's you know what I've been doing for uh, every year I've been in the Air Force, but I will do either job. And then they started asking me, well, wouldn't you rather be a pilot? And they, you know, and I stuck to my guns. I just said, I'll do either job, whatever, whatever uh, I'm best qualified for. Mm -hmm. And when I got the phone call from John Young, you know, Apollo 16, STS-1 <laughs> astronaut John Young called me. That was January 16th of 1990. Uh, he went through this long dissertation on the phone about, do you still want to come and work for us? And I said, yes, sir. And then he went into, we have simulators, we have P-38s, we da, da, da. And, you know, we have all these jobs. And after about five minutes of this, he said, do you have any questions? And I said, well, yes, sir. Am I going to be a pilot or a mission specialist? And he said, oh, pilot, you're going to be <laughs> the first woman pilot. <laughs> so he, like he forgot to tell me that. Oh, no. Wow. But it was Let's, great. It was great to, to meet him. He was on our selection board. So mm -hmm. a great, great man. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, uh, I think we'll take a, a quick break, but then we'll talk. You've got four flights to go through. Um, and my favorite, 114, because it was my first ever space shuttle mission as a reporter. So uh, so we'll, we'll be right back. All right. Well, well now we're back. <laughs> Apparently, uh, it was a very fast break. Um, but uh, Eileen, so you you flew uh, first on uh, STS-63 uh, and then uh, STS-84, both to uh, the Russian space station, uh, Mir, uh, and, then, uh, and then, of course, uh, as pilot. And, and on STS-93 uh, to launch uh, what is now the Chandra X-ray Observatory. I was surprised uh to to ha to hear you uh, have to go through that the whole advanced x-ray facility name that it originally had uh way back then um and then and then of course uh, uh rounded out the the, the flights with STS 114 in in 2005 which is the one that that I covered uh as my first uh, my first mission at space.com i just become the space flight reporter actually uh for that one in uh 04 during the lead up for that that flight um and and i'm i'm curious so you you join in 1990 and uh, and then you you start training uh, for uh, flights, but I mean, how what was the gap like for you uh, between becoming an astronaut and and then training for that first flight and getting named to a flight uh, for STS sixty three? Well, well, I think that of course I trained and trained and practiced and practiced. I I did a job with Orbiter Systems. I was uh, what we call a Cape Crusader. I worked down at Kennedy Space Center, strapping in crews and uh, running tests on the orbiters. And then I was at Capcom working in mission control uh, before I flew my first flight. And it was almost five years uh, before I got my first flight. But I'll tell you, today they're waiting much longer. Some are going sooner and some are waiting much longer. There's mm -hmm. less flights today. So the, a class of astronauts will be stretched out a little bit more on their first flight. It, it is like agony waiting for your first flight, <laughs> I, I would admit. When you, but I, I want to tell you something that's very important. When my class had their very first class meeting with the boss and the chief of the office was Dan Brandenstein at the time, he said to us, this program is not fair and I can't make it fair. One of you is going to fly first and one of you is going to fly last. And there's 23 of us, by the way. Uh -huh. He said, I want the when the first one of you flies, I want the other 22 to support that person. Same deal. When the last one of you flies, I want the 22 of you that have already flown to support that person. And you're, you're a team. And I think that was a great, I, I still remember this today, <laughs> a great piece of advice because our class was very close and we all supported each other. Um, I was the second to the last in my class to fly. Um, it was agony waiting because my mission kept delaying, delaying, delaying. And uh, my commander, Jim Weatherby, reminded me, Oh, do you know who the last person was to fly from? I think it was the class of 63, Neil Armstrong. <laughs> so, you know, just because you're the last to fly doesn't mean, you know, you're not going to have some great opportunities in the future. So it is agony to wait. I know the astronauts today have to wait uh, much longer. So I just say, you know, you're there and do the best job you can. So by the time you fly, 
you're ready. Well, then my next two flights came very, very fast. I mean, I mm-hmm. flew in 1995, turned right around, flew uh, again in 1997, and then turned around and flew again in 1999. Mm-hmm. I had a big delay. I didn't fly again until 2005 because uh, there was a, you know, the service module, uh, or I want to say uh, the Russian section of the uh, space station was being delayed. Yeah. And we all, then we had the accident. And so there was a long that, delay before my last flight. But I think it's, things don't always go your way in life. You don't always get the job you want or, you, or when you want it, but take advantage of the opportunities that are open to you. Yeah. When one door closes, like another door opens and it, it was, I had to learn that and, and, and it was hard. So you, you mentioned that, that, that pay. So SDS 63, that's on discovery. Uh, the, which is, you know, at the Smithsonian now. Um, and, and you were, you were the pilot for that mission Then you visited Mir, right? With a space, but you didn't dock for that one. Um, and then STS 84, uh, with, which was in 97, that, that was on Atlantis. And, and then you, you did in fact dock at Mir. Um, and then, uh, in, in 99, that's your first flight as commander on Columbia, I think, right, from 93, STS-93, if, if memory serves. Uh, and that's to launch Chandra. Uh, and then STS-114 returned to flight, which which we can discuss in, in a bit, too, uh, to the space station. So, like, three uh, uh, three different destinations, you know, on, on four very different missions there. Um, for those, those first three coming back to back every couple of years like that, um, uh, is that like a, is it is it a, is it a, I guess the question is, is it a, is it a frenetic pace? Is it a pace that 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 you can keep up with? Uh, with a lot of different mission details there. And is there one of those four missions that really stands out as as your favorite to you? You know, if it's, <laughs> I'm I'm curious. About yeah. So the pace is very fast. When you first get assigned to a flight, you're jumping right into it. Um, when I was commander on my third flight, with the Chandra flight, when we got assigned, we only had. I think it was nine months until launch. Well, it ended up delaying. So we ended up getting a full over a year to train. But at the time, so we had to jump right in, get the training plan, you know, cram it all in the schedule. And some things had to drop out because you only can, a person can only handle so much. And as the commander, it was important to me to make sure that my crew rested. They had time to go home, get enough sleep, go to the gym, you know, eat right, take care of themselves. And, and so sometimes things have to drop off the schedule. As a commander, I, I mean, my job is to make sure that the crew is trained for the flight and then, of course, the onboard execution. So that was a very uh, frenetic pace. And I'm trying to remember your second question. You had well, a, I, a, another good question in there. It's just a, it seems like each of the missions is very different. And uh, and trying to kind of keep up that 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 pace, you know, how, how do you, I guess, adapt to a new mission? I, I'm like, just thinking of going going to a space station and rendezvousing and actually docking, you know, seems very different, you know. And and uh, and oh, you know what it was? It was which one was the, your favorite mission out of those? Oh, those which missions? one was my? <laughs> oh, I almost I, I almost I got distracted. <laughs> I would say that I don't actually have a favorite mission. Um, they were all they all had, you know, great things about them. But if I could fly one over again, I would fly my second mission over. I was not. The commander. Uh, mm-hmm. okay, so I enjoy being the commander, but there's a ton of responsibilities that go with that. Um, I was a pilot on my second mission. We docked with the space station Mir, but my jobs on that flight were actually really fun. <laughs> and I can't say that it was fun on my other flights, yeah. but I got to photograph uh, Comet Hale Bop. I got to photograph the moon. I had a job. I had to photograph all of the exterior of Mir, you know, what I could see from the windows that we were at. Um, I got to be on the Mir space station, which I actually enjoyed being there um, and spending time with our Russian uh, cosmonaut friends over there. And the Mir was, it was just a fun place to be (laughs) and to explore all of the modules there. You might remember that we added the Perota and Spectre modules, which made that space station much bigger than it originally was before the U.S. came into the shuttle Mir program. And, you know, I enjoyed going over to Russia and learning about the culture over there. It's very different. Um, the people are very much the same, but the culture is different. Um, I was learning the Russian language. It was something so totally different than what I had expected when I first applied 
to the astronaut program. I never thought mm -hmm. I'd be on a Russian spacecraft. Huh. Um, but that, in, in, so I did a lot of other fun uh, experiments. And I would say I had, I had the, and nothing broke. <laughs> that was the other thing. Not, nothing broke. We went, that mission, it was STS-84. It launched on the day it was scheduled to launch a year prior. Wow. No wow. delays, nothing broke. It, it was, or Atlantis, which <laughs> down at the Cape, they call it the cleanest orbiter and it had the least <laughs> number of problems with it. Um, but I would fly that mission over again first, but all of them were, were great missions. You brought up a really interesting point about working with Russia. Uh, and I, I ask because now, of course, there's a lot of challenges uh, that, that NASA and, and I guess the world is facing with you know, Russia's war in, in Ukraine. And it's caused a lot of ripples through the space industry with cooperation. Uh, and I, I was curious about how, I mean, because when, when, on 114, you flew not just uh, to the space station, which had Russian cosmonauts aboard, but you had Suichi Noguchi aboard uh, of, of Japan. Um, and that, uh, uh, that pattern has continued, you know, the international nature of the International Space Station uh, and NASA has plans um, uh, to continue that to the moon. And I was curious how that, how that relationship went, like how valuable you found the, I, I guess, like the merging of ideals or the, the cooperation between the different countries, the different agencies uh, to get missions to the space station like, like, like yours done, especially 114 after the Columbia accident where you had a, a lot of changes uh, to, to change how flight with the shuttles would work there. Yeah, there's a lot I can say about that. Um, STS-114, you know, was the first flight after the Columbia accident. And there was two and a half years from the accident till we finally got back to the space station. That two and a half years, the Russians launched our astronauts to the space station. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to go there at all. Mm -hmm. So we sent our astronauts over there to train on Soyuz. And then, of course, after we shut the shuttle program down in 2011, for that until 2020, but nine years, yeah. the Russians launched our astronauts out of Kazakhstan for us. I mean, we had that program going with them. <clears throat> I also want to say that Sergei Krikalov, who was the commander of the space station when I went there in the summer of 2005, wasn't a friend of mine from many years ago. When he first came to Houston in 1993, his desk was like right there next to me. <laughs> so in, he was very, he, his English was very good. Um, also with him came uh, Vladimir Titov, who I got assigned to fly with on my first flight, or he was assigned to fly with us on the first flight. And I got to know their families and uh, got to learn a little bit of the language. And, and I would have to say these these cosmonauts, they're just like us. They're humans. You know, we're all we all have that you know human nature, but their culture is different. So in in the way they run their space program is different. But I think as we came together we took the strong points of both of our space programs and made it better. And it really breaks my heart to see what's going on now in Ukraine and what that's going to do eventually to our space program. Now we decided in the short term, we can't split up our space stations. That's just yeah. not technically feasible. So in, in the reason we still are launching Americans in Russia and the cosmonauts in Florida, we're continuing. We want to make sure that we have, I say we, the space station program wants to make sure that there's at least one American, at least one Russian on the space station at all times to operate those segments. Mm -hmm. So you can have a better, this is risk management, right? You have a better opportunity for that if you are still, you know, uh, launching cross between the countries. So I think NASA is doing a good job. I think that space exploration is above politics. That yeah. That's the way. I see it. And I hope that we can continue to cooperate. But, you know, it's not I, I don't have like a real optimistic view of the future in the way this is going. And I hope things get solved sooner rather than later, because we could end up, you know, the Russians have said they're going to pull out of the space station. You know, who knows when they're going to do it and they're going to work with China. Mm -hmm. And I think that's bad. I would like to see us working together, but maybe I'm yeah. being too idealistic. Yeah, I think we see we've seen a few of those those repercussions already. You mentioned Russia and China have their own lunar plans together. NASA, of course, is still working with the International Consortium uh, with, with the Artemis programs. Is there at least some optimism that you see that the programs are continuing? I mean, Artemis 1 did fly uh, more or less, uh, 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 you know, uh, cleanly, and we've got the new crew being announced fairly soon uh, for Artemis 2. Um, 
Uh, I mean, is, are you excited to kind of see where we actually get to for the moon? Oh, I'm tremendously excited. I follow this day to day to day to day to day. And I think this Artemis program is going well so far. And you could see, um, you know, what we've done so far with Artemis One. I mean, I kept congratulating the leaders at NASA and the contractors. Great job. Y'all did a great <laughs> job. And they all went, it was it was delayed, <laughs> you know, it took too long. And, you know, they want to be perfect, but you know, that that's good. But I, I really am very excited about where we're going. And I am glad that we're doing it internationally. There's going to be a Canadian um, on Artemis II, a, a Canadian astronaut. And I, th I think it's good that we will continue with the international aspect because space exploration is for the whole planet, right? And I think it also helps with peace back here on Earth. Um, it was so good when we were working with the Russians. I mean, that started in 1993 yeah. and even before that with Apollo Soyuz. So, uh, and, and I'm also excited to see the first landing on the moon, Artemis mm -hmm. three. And then when we go to Mars, I, I'm very, very excited about <laughs> landing a person on Mars someday. I have no idea who it's going to be, but yeah. uh, it, it will happen. Well, uh, we, we know that there will be a first woman on the moon in in short order and and the first woman on mars uh what message would you have and this is probably the last question we'll have time for today uh for 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 the women and the young girls who are aspiring to careers like uh like yours as an astronaut or as a pilot or in engineering or really or just kind of you know any any type of um of science or, or technology career like what, is there like a nugget that you can share uh, with them what to keep in mind well, you know, I like to tell young people, uh, you know, I, I name my book through the glass ceiling to the stars. You know, I'd say think about the stars, set yourself like exciting goals. You know, we want to make them realistic, like something that is possible, but set high goals and try to uh, make a path to get there. And there's going to be setbacks along the way, like I talk about in the book, mistakes I made, you know, things maybe I would have done differently. Um, but learn from your mistakes and keep pushing on. And I have a lot of tidbits in there. Um, I think that young people really, everybody really needs to get into STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, but you also need to learn you know, English and history and all uh, social studies, all that, everything else. I'm like a learning sponge. I mean, I <laughs> love learning things. And I think young people like do your homework, listen to your teacher, select, when you go to college, select the tough courses. Don't drop out of engineering. I see these young people say, I want to be an engineer. I want to design. I want to create. I want to invent. And they go through the first year of college and they flunk physics or they get a D in, you know, some computing course. Don't quit. Keep trying. Maybe you might need an extra semester. But if you can get through that first year, it gets better. And, you know, sometimes young women will, oh, I'm the only woman in the class and Maybe they don't like that and they'll drop out. Just, you know, just stick it through. And, you know, you might not get straight A's. That's okay. These young people, they all got straight A's in high school and now they're getting B's, C's and D's in college. And that kind of hurts your ego. Just keep trying because you, I think you are more valuable to this country as a, you have a hard degree that is needed like engineering, maybe you got B's and C's yeah. Then having a degree in something that's, we have too many degrees. They're all A's, but we have too many degrees and now you can't find a job. Yeah. And, and I don't want to pick out any particular ones, but you know, there's some degrees where we have too many people mm -hmm. and I think we need more, we need more teachers. We need more engineers. We need more scientists and uh, go, go for what you <laughs> go for what you love and read books read about science fiction, read about history, read about possibilities. So those are the, I want to say the messages I like to give to young people, but even my, my age group, you know, reading is just wonderful. I'm, I'm a big reader of history now. <laughs> I think I've read like too many science fiction books and now I kind of <laughs> reverted to history. So I'm reading about various aspects of uh, history because history repeats itself. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. That that is great advice. I think for anyone young and old. And speaking about reading, uh the the the, the book uh by Colonel Eileen Collins is Through the Glass Ceiling uh to the Stars, the story of the first American woman uh, to command a space mission. Uh the new paperback edition is out uh now. 
and uh, I hope everyone uh, gets a chance to uh, to pick it up. Uh, but thank you so much, uh, Eileen, for uh, for for your time. I really, really do appreciate you joining us, and and to you, uh, viewers and listeners, thank you for joining us on our discussion with uh, Colonel Eileen Collins, a true inspiration to young people uh, and women all around the world. Uh, Eileen, where where can folks, if they want to find you, uh, where can they kind of keep track of of your latest adventures in space and on Earth? Well, I'm on LinkedIn. I've got lots of followers on LinkedIn and I occasionally write there. Um, I don't like to brag about myself, so I don't like <laughs> to post there a lot, but I do have some articles that I've written over probably the past seven years or so on LinkedIn. And I have a website that I'm kind of redoing right now. And of course you can pick up the book at, it's at Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I saw it at Target on the shelf uh, a while ago. So I, I made it to Target. So uh, <laughs> maybe the book is doing good. Great. No, well, that that's great. And uh, we'll definitely have to include that link for folks that want to follow your uh, your writings on, on LinkedIn for sure. And, and of course, you can find me at space.com as always or on the Twitter at Tarek J. Malik. In a couple of weeks, I'll be in Colorado at the Space Symposium. That'll be uh, very exciting. But I think we'll all be on pins and needles for NASA's big announcement on April 3rd uh, for their new Artemis II crew with Canada. So we'll, that's where you can find me watching at glued to NASA television. Uh, don't forget uh, to drop us a line at twist at twit.tv. That's T-W-I-S at twit.tv. Uh, and we welcome your comments, suggestions, your ideas, your space jokes as well. Please don't forget that. Uh, and, uh, and we do uh, try to get to your comments and answer them with each care. Rod is really good at that. I'm still working on it, but I do read them. Um, don't forget again to check out space.com. Our website is in the name, not the space bar, the actual word. Uh, and the National Space Society, uh, Rod's uh, home stomping grounds. Uh, both are great places to satisfy your uh, spaceflight cravings. Uh, new episodes of uh, This Week in Space, they publish every Friday on your favorite podcaster. So do make sure that you like, you subscribe, you tell your friends uh, to share that great message of um, of space. Uh, give us five stars and a thumbs up if you like it. And if you don't, at least a thumbs up would be nice. And you can always see us at uh, our website at twit.tv slash twists. Uh, and don't forget, you can get all of the great programming on the Twit Network ad-free on Club Twit, as well as some extras that are only available there for just $7 a month. So do check it out. And uh, and you can follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter and Facebook and at twit.tv on Instagram. Uh, so uh, thank you all uh, for joining us, and we'll see you at the next one. Hey, we should talk Linux. It's the operating system that runs the internet, a bunch of game consoles, cell phones, and maybe even the machine on your desk. But you already knew all that. What you may not know is that TwitNow has a show dedicated to it, The Untitled Linux Show. Whether you're a Linux pro, a burgeoning sysadmin, or just curious what the big deal is, you should join us on the Club Twit Discord every Saturday afternoon for news, analysis, and tips to sharpen your Linux skills. And then make sure you subscribe to the Club Twit exclusive Untitled Linux Show. Wait, you're not a Club Twit member yet? Well, go to twit.tv clubtwit and sign up. Hope to see you there.